بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد This is the fourth cause of istighfar which the author called الذنوب العدمية The previous one he called it الوجودية He tattletales, he causes enmity, he steals There exist an actual sins that sinners do And when one does something they are generally mindful and aware of it. And with those types of sins that we mentioned, they know generally that they're wrong. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them, they seek istighfar and tawbah. I didn't elaborate on that term in the previous cause because it's better explained with this one here. Those sins exist in the previous cause. The sinners are mindful of them because they're actually doing them. Here it's the opposite. الذنوب العدمية They don't exist. How do they not exist but one gets sinned for them? Because they're matters that are written and obligated on individuals yet they don't do them. Not doing them is the sin. That's why he referred to them as التروق Matters that are abandoned and left out. In the previous cause he used الوجودية Sins that exist. Here, in this cause, he used the opposite, al-adamiyya. They don't exist. And we explained how. In the previous cause, he used al-zahira, clear and apparent. Here, he left that out because they're not as clear and apparent to people here. The previous cause, the last cause we mentioned, they're the most popular. That It's the most popular cause. And the sins under are the most popular sins. They're apparent and clear. While this one here is not as clear because people are heedless of it. Because it's not something you're doing, it's what you're not doing. The author states that this cause is common among matters that pertain to the rights of others. Like the rights of parents or spouses or children or relatives or neighbors or Muslims amongst each other or ordaining the good and forbidding the evil. Transgression in these types of rights and obligations is not performing them or fulfilling them. And they're what could eat up your deeds on a day that you won't even give your own mother a single deed. The effect of the sins under this cause to your deeds are like the effect of termites to the structure of a mansion or a house. Termites are silent killers to the house. And these types of sins are silent killers to your deeds. That's what these turuk, at turuk as he referred to them, do to your deeds. One gets occupied in furud. He does his farah. But he's mindless of rights that chew away that hard-earned deeds that he performed. When you're told, Iqra' kitabak, read your book with the undisputable evidence before Allah, it's not only what one did that he will be reading. It's also going to contain what he didn't do that he was supposed to do. Rights of parents that one didn't fulfill. It's overall uh, rare to see someone physically abuse or uh, kill their parents. It may happen. It just happened recently in our community where a son killed his mother, so-called Muslim as well. But overall, it's known to be wrong. If a believer screams at his parents, he won't be able to sleep until he begs Allah for forgiveness and seeks their forgiveness as well. If that happens, that falls under the previous category. Al-Muharramat al-Zahira. Okay, but someone won't abuse them. He won't yell at them. He won't even tell them off. All of which fall under the previous cause of istighfar. But at the same time, he may not go to them and serve them. That falls under this cause. As-Safarini said, وَمِنْ حُقُوقِهِمَا خِدْمَتُهُمَا إِذَا احْتَاجَ إِلَى خِدْمَةً it's wajib to serve him. So that falls under this category. He didn't say, oh, he didn't beat him. But at the same time, he left out the duty and obligation of serving them. at Take this a step further. He doesn't say, oh, to them. He actually serves them. He still needs istighfar under this cause for not serving them enough to fulfill that right. لا يجزي ولد والدا You'll never fulfill the right of your parents no matter how much you serve them unless you found them as slaves and emancipated them as the hadith states. 
That's just an example to understand this cause and similar to that example is the rights of spouses, the rights of children, the rights of those who are slandered, the rights of the captives, the rights of ulama. How many parents think that just because they gave birth to their children, their children don't have rights over them? And likewise, the rights of relatives, neighbors, Muslims amongst each other. People generally neglect a lot of them completely, so it falls under a turu. And even if one does try to fulfill them, we're humans who have flaws. In addition to examples that pertain to rights of others, the author also mentions and includes the example of al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar, abandoning, ordaining the good and forbidding the evil, which is practically forgotten these days. In Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba Hudayfa was asked, who do you consider the living dead? He said, those who abandon al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar, those who abandon ordaining the good and forbidding the evil. That's why a true da'ya, he considered them the living dead. That's why a true da'ya prefers the underground than over it when he can't do amr bil ma'roof and nahi an al munkar or, or he's banned from it and he's willing to risk the most valuable to perform it. It's such an important neglected obligation that returns upon one in dunya and akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy and spare households or towns or countries from punishment, if they have muslihun. Muslihun are people who are righteous and ordain the good and forbid the evil. Even if there's not many salihun who are righteous, but don't ordain the good and forbid the evil. وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ لِيُهْلِكَ الْقُرَىٰ بِظُلْمٍ وَأَهْلُهَا مصلحون. But if there's salihun, a lot of salihun, righteous people who don't ordain the good and forbid the evil, yet there's no muslihun, then it's a cause of punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people have not done inkar and munkar in a long time, not with their hands or their tongues, when they're able to, and not even in their hearts. And that's how sins become the norm. Why would forms of tabarruj that are worse than the tabarruj that we read in the description of tabarruj al-jahiliyyat al-ula, the first pre-Islam ignorance, why would they become a norm today? Al-Qurtubi mentioned tabarruj from the time of Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa alayhi salam and before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But not only do we have tabarruj worse than those eras that are public and popular and manifest in the norm, but what's startling? is that it's now considered hijab. And what some men do publicly without shame or fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even worse. And what's startling is they're labeled religious. Would that reach that level if there was active inkar of the munkar going on? Al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar is the first characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that made us the best nation. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas the fashion today is to do the inkar on the very few who actually do inkar of the munkar. One may not steal or do namima, cause enmity between Muslims, or lie, or post that which is haram to hear or see for the world to see. That falls under the former cause of istighfar. But at the same time, he or she may see that same haram in person, or in online groups that they're involved in, or generally online, where it's become common, and they'll not forbid that munkar. When the means are available and easy before them. Some have an illusion that they may not even realize that they have, and it's that they think that online or social media are exempt from inkar and munkar. Habitually seeing haram without inkar of the munkar destroys the imanic immune system and sins become the norm to the heart over time and that's dangerous. When you log into social media accounts, you have terms and pledges with Allah you need to fulfill. You have the pledge of Muslim. We pledge to the Messenger وسلم, to advise every Muslim. How many pass or see something of munkar? comment or message privately the individual. And this is online and in person. But I'm saying online because that's where it's lacking. 
let them know sins they're promoting are like telling Allah, Ya Allah, my sins are not enough. I need sins to go viral on the left side of my scale on the judgment day when I stand before you. Every one of the millions who see it and listen to it, whatever it may be of the various types of munkar, the original producer lays in his grave or her grave until Yom din which could be hundreds or thousands or millions of years. So long as that sin is still circulating, they're in the grave getting that sin. They will carry their own heavy loads of sins and the heavy loads of whomever they cause to go astray. Sometimes the munkarat may be in aqeedah or in slander of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or the believers, muwahideen, the pure muwahideen who the globe love to attack or circulate in weak hadith or words of shirk or oath by other than Allah or instruments of the shaitan or tabarraj or other matters that have become so common. A person may never slander, which falls under the previous cause, but he may see it and not do inkar of that munkar, and that falls under this cause from two avenues. The author said most of this cause are rights of others, and it's the right of a Muslim over another to defend him if he's being slandered. You're not slandered, the previous cause, but you're leaving something out which is defending him. And you need istighfar from that. The second avenue is that when you see someone being slandered, you're leaving, forbidden, the evil. And that's one of the examples that he gave. Ulama in dua, in muwahideen, and muwahidat are systematically slandered day and night. It's their right that we defend them when we see that they're being slandered. A alim or a muwahid, especially those with proper upbringing in da'wah, they don't really care if anyone defends them or not. But that doesn't dismiss his right of us defending him. Once upon a time, when I was active on social media, there was a young chef who suddenly went inactive. Uh, he said, when I asked him, everyone's attacking him. Ulama and tulab al turned away. And he said, the best of them are the ones who are silent. And in sorrow, he wrote me a poem, a poem by Ibn Rumi, who's from the Abbasi Khilafah. He said, وَإِخْوَانٌ حَسِبْتُهُمُ دُرُوعًا فَكَانُوهَا وَلَكِنْ لِلْأَعَادِ Brothers, I thought were shields, and they turned out to be so, but they shielded my enemies. وَخِلْتُهُمُ سِهَامًا صَائِبَاتٍ فَكَانُوهَا وَلَكِنْ فِي فُؤَادِ I thought they were arrows that don't miss the target and they turned out to be so. But they aimed their arrows to my heart. I advised him, but he never returned until he returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his soul be among those suspended and hanging from his throne. A da'iya shrugs off the distress in her, if any, if any, you shouldn't let it get to you, but if any, he shrugs it off with two rak'at in a deep, sincere, long sajda, not lifting his head until the hurt turns into delight. Adaya is unflappable. Slander and attacks of the globe should it phase him. You got it wrong if that's not what you expected when you're spreading the pure tawheed or believe in it. Before we drift any further, my point is that a da'ya or a prisoner or a muwahid or a muwahida, they don't care. Or I should say, they shouldn't care if one defends them or not. But regardless of that, you have an obligation to defend the honor of any Muslim if you're able to. It's a right of his. Fulfillment of the obligation of ordaining the good and forbidding the evil. You always hear, well, they're stubborn. They're not going to listen. What use is it? The obligation is to do inkar of the munkar and ordain the good. The outcome is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa called people to Islam who died kuffar. 
The question was clearly answered in the Quran. A group forbidden the evil were asked, why do you preach? They're doomed to destruction, so why are you advising them? It's useless. The ones forbidden the evil said to them, it's to free ourselves from guilt and blame when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To free ourselves from guilt and blame from not forbidding the evil and ordaining the good because they know they're going to be asked about that. Perhaps, maybe they fear Allah and abstain. So in conclusion, what's this cause? It's istighfar for matter one leaves out and doesn't do like that which is common among fulfilling the rights of others and like that of ordaining the good and forbidding the evil.